Let's get into this. All of us in this movement, and I'm going to just make a big leap of faith here, an assumption that we're, we're in agreement here generally in this group, unless there's a Monsanto plant in here, uh, <laughs> about things aren't real good and we're wanting to encourage local food systems, small farmers, authentic food, culinary, domestic culinary arts, um, you know, all sorts of cool things, less government um, intervention in our choices. And so, so this is kind of our movement. This is, you know, where we've been headed. And um, the most common question that I get asked, and probably many of you, by naysayers, by the folks still running the, you know, the uh, 2,4-D sprayer around their lawns and, and, and whatever, um, is... Oh, that all sounds real nice, but can we really feed the world? In fact, it may be that some of us here wrestle deep down with, man, I wish I had a better answer for that. So, what I would like to do over the next little bit is to explore that and give us ammunition, um, affirmation, confidence that we don't go into these discussions uh, on the defensive. Uh, we go in on the offensive and, um, and, and have some backup. So, I have five basic points. So if you're watching, you will know. The first one will take half the time. The other four will go faster. Because the first one is a history lesson. So, we all struggle with myopia. We do. Uh, that's why I wrote the book, Folks, This Ain't Normal. I've done a lot of college speaking, and I just realized these college kids, they just, they just don't realize that there was a day when you didn't have a laptop. <laughs> and there was a day when you didn't have a cell phone, let alone a smartphone. I mean, I can remember when you had to turn a dial. My parents remember when you called up the op, you know, these things, um, but it's so quick, it's so easy to, to forget, isn't it? Uh, life is fleeting, um, things change, and it's so easy to forget how things were. So, let me go through a couple of things that I think are important as we set a stage. Pre-European America, pre-European America, Okay. Before the Spanish came, before the English came, before the French came, before the Dutch came, all right? And I'm going to give you some general figures, and I've gleaned these from numerous anthropologic books and things that I've read over the years, so, so you know, don't argue with them, just, it's a, it's a composite, all right? 200 million beavers. 200 million beavers. We know from uh, skeleton remains that some of these were as big as a Volkswagen vehicle. I'd like to meet that beaver. <laughs> Coming from behind a tree. These beavers built ponds so that 8%, 8% of, Amer what if today America, 8% of our landscape was water. Now it's 0.5%. Imagine 8%. And this was true in Utah, New Mexico. I've talked with anthropologists there, archaeologists. They all confirm, even in the arid west, 8% water. Imagine what that would do to ambient temperature, migratory waterfowl, uh, biodiversity, hydration of the landscape. I mean, all sorts of cool things. All right. There were 200 million bison. Two million wolves, each of whom needed 20 pounds of meat a day. That's 40 million pounds of meat, by the way. Birds. We often don't think about the birds, but um, 
John J. Ottoman sat under a tree in 1820, recorded in his di- or, or 1800, 1818, 1820, recorded in his diary. He was just sitting under this tree, and he couldn't see the sun for three days because of the flock of passenger pigeons that was flying over. Has anybody seen the sun blocked out for three days for a flock of birds flying over? Of any kind. I mean, I, I think you could release all the birds in half the Tyson chicken houses and still, if they could fly, and still not blot out the sun for three days. And this was done without Cargill, without John Deere, without plows, without hybrid seed corn. That, that's kind of amazing to think about, isn't it? And now, of course, the passenger pigeon is extinct. And that doesn't come out. Prairie chickens and pheasants and turkeys and all sorts of other things. The Native American population, of course, was decimated between 1492 and 1600. 90% of the Native population succumbed to European diseases, measles, smallpox, um, between 1492 and 1600, and it's why all of us that are baby boomers grew up in elementary school learning about manifest destiny, and this was the land of Canaan and this open area where nobody lived. But a scant century before that, there were still, there were more people living in Nebraska and Kansas than live there today. So it gives me pause to realize that pre-European America actually produced more nutritional food than we do today. That should give us pause. And it gives me confidence that when we look at those templates to mimic in our farming models, we're on the right track. Okay? Now, the Europeans came, colonized this, and the European uh, um, thing was based on extraction. It wasn't based on sustainable production. It wasn't based on regeneration, um, on rejuvenation or redemptive capacity. It was all about extraction, exploitation, and moving on uh, is in the American DNA. And so by the time of Thomas Jefferson, there were um, vibrant, on the, in the East at least, not here, but in the East there were vibrant soil societies. A lot of people don't realize um, that was the uh, social, the agrarian social group. And of course, remember at that time in the, um, it, it, as an agricultural economy, this is before, you know, uh, factories and the industrial revolution, you know, uh, farming was the, 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 the um, you know, Jefferson and Washington and these guys were the uh, Bill Gateses of their day. And, um, and, and the question on soil fertility by the 18, 1800 was how do we maintain fertility? Uh, you know, on the East Coast, you know, uh, our house was built in 1790, okay? So it's an old American chestnut log cabin. The American chestnuts are now gone. But in 1790, you know, our town was settled in 1740. Um, so by 1800, uh, there was already this, this tremendous problem with, um, with fertility. We're always looking for fertility. And Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson has a wonderful farm book. If you ever get a chance to read his uh, Jefferson's farm book, it's fabulous. And um, I read it a couple times. And it's interesting that the four pillars of Thomas Jefferson's agriculture system, stay with me here. I, I hope this history doesn't bore you because, because I think understanding our American historical DNA is important to understand where we are and how we got here. All right. So, so Jefferson's four pillars of agriculture, of, of how he's going to make this money with this plantation, is number one, exports. Exports. It was all about how do we grow grain and ship it to England? How do we grow grain and ship it to England? Or how do we grow tobacco and ship it to, to, to you know, England? It was all about exports. Number two, fertility comes from elsewhere. So they were always looking for some magic input from somewhere. Um, and in fact, when in 1827, the... Um, the uh, booby cormorant and pelican poop on the, off the coast of Chile was uh, found. Steamships and uh, Chinese slave labor 
extracted a couple of millennia of buildup of booby, cormorant, and pelican poop in 20 years. The, the poop, in some cases, was 100 feet deep of solid poop that was dug and, and, and shoveled down uh, chutes into these steamships that then took it to America and Great Britain because they were the only two countries rich enough to afford to be able to, to transport that. But, but think about that. In 20 years, a millennia or more of this poop buildup was gone. Fertility comes from elsewhere. Number three, the holy grail is arable grain farming. Grain is the holy grail. Now, there's a reason why it was the holy grail was because grain was expensive. As we saw this morning in um, Laura's first presentation about scything grain, um, she and Monty found out very quickly that scything grain, we wouldn't eat that much bread. Why, why is baking and bread making and all that, why is that such a cultural, like, like you know, historically it's this pinnacle of, of sustenance because it was hard to get. And in a time when, you know, you had to scythe it and you had to, um, uh, you know, flail it and winnow it, and do all these things and then, and then try to store it before steel butler, you know, grain storage silos to keep the rats out of it. I mean, much of the, much of the um, military prowess of ancient civilizations was done guarding the great big 12 foot high clay pots holding the, the kingdoms or the tribes or the, the civilization's grain so rats didn't get in it before next year. And, and, and so grain was expensive. I mean, the Bible talks about, a, 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 in the Old Testament, and I think it's about Habakkuk, it talks about a, um, a harlot being sold for an ephah and a half of bar barley. An ephah and a half is only, about, uh, is only about a third of a bushel of barley. So a harlot for, sold for a, for a third of a bushel of barley, you know, it's not because harlots were cheap. <laughs> and if there's any kids here, you parents can explain that to them later. But you know, grain farming, when, when you don't have mechanical energy and everything is, is, is um, animal powered, you know, uh, much of the production of a farm up until very recent times was providing the pasture for oxen and mules and, and horses for, for the draft power, which were, of course were all herbivores. And so, so this, this grain thing was a big deal. Uh, pasture was just considered, you know, a necessary thing in order to have the energy to do the real meaningful thing, which was grain. So arable grain farming. And finally, number four, cheap labor called slaves. I want you to think about those four agricultural pillars of Thomas Jefferson. Exports, fertility from elsewhere, Grain, cheap labor. I didn't make the Jefferson Foundation happy at Monticello when they asked me to come and speak at their <laughs> annual banquet. <clears throat> and the title of my talk was, Would Thomas Jefferson Have Had a Tyson Chicken House? And the answer is an unequivocal yes. Yes, he very much would have. And so those four pillars set the stage for early American agricultural worldview thinking. So here we are, we've got soil societies, we've got Jefferson, I mean, the, 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 if you read uh, Pharsalia and these diaries of these plantation owners, I mean, they had an insatiable uh, uh, quest for finding another, a, a new hollow, a new ridge top that had virgin timber that they could cut and burn and open for new grain farming that hadn't already been depleted. This, this was, a, this was just, just consuming in the life of these guys by the 18, 18, 1820, 1830. And trying to solve that dilemma of fertility was this famous Austrian chemist named Justus von Liebig, who in 1837 
uh, shocked the world with his discovery using vacuum tubes that all of life, all of plants, all of you and I, all of animals, all of life is simply a reconfiguration of nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. Good, you're sharp. Okay. I, I knew it. I just wanted to make sure you did. <laughs> nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus. NPK. He is the godfather, considered the godfather of chemical uh, of modern chemical agriculture. The guy was sincerely spirited. He was not trying to start a conspiracy of destroying the planet, okay? He was sincerely trying to solve this for the soil fertility issues. If I can just solve that, you know, we'll, we'll be okay. And so that was 1837. Two other things happened in 1837. I find this just totally fascinating. <clears throat> a blacksmith inventor entrepreneur who actually lived 12 miles from our farm. I mean, I wasn't there at the time, but he was. His name was Cyrus McCormick. And Cyrus McCormick was diddling around in his shop. He and his dad, they'd been working and working and working. And finally, 1837, they released to public uh, acclaim the first reaper, which eliminated the scythe. That was a breakthrough. It's hard for us sitting here to appreciate what the scythe did. I mean, uh, it, it would be as revolutionary as what an app can do on a smartphone. And I don't have a clue because I don't even have a smartphone. So I'm a total Luddite. But anyway, Cyrus McCormick invented this Reaper. And, and that is considered, same year, that's considered the official start of the Industrial Revolution. Your history books will tell you that's the, that's the start of the Industrial Revolution, which was also the, the facilitator or the enabler of factories and massive urbanization. See, urbanization was always held in check in ancient times because with draft power and lack of machines, you simply couldn't build cities so big that they outran their abil the ability of a team of oxen to bring fodder in and haul poop out. You know, you just, you just couldn't, you just couldn't have that dense and that urban a, a population. But with, with mechanization now, you could. And finally, in 1837, another thing happened. A famous fellow set sail on a ship called the Beagle from England. His name was Charles Darwin. I think it's fascinating for us to sit back and look at in 1837. We had Justice von Liebig telling us that life is just a rearrangement of inanimate particulate matter. Cyrus McCormick developing the mechanical revolution that was ready to come. And Charles Darwin telling us God doesn't have anything to do with it. That is a confluence of really big things. Do you agree? Yes. Big deal. So this set up a new paradigm toward life, which was fundamentally mechanical. Prior to this, the view toward life was everything from animism to paganism to theism. But life prior to this always had some sort of a, of a spirit element to it in, in, in primitive cultures. But now suddenly life could be boiled down to mechanics, a simplistic mechanical view. Now, John Eichard, the professor emeritus of University of Missouri, um, developed this, this theme um, moving toward the four pillars of industrialization. Think about this. The four pillars of industrialization are specialization, simplification, routinization, and mechanization. Okay? You go into a factory, you go into an industry, it's all about specialized jobs. It's all about simplified jobs. I mean, I mean, where I am in the East Coast, we do all these big chicken processing facilities. They, they tell me that the average job in a 1,500 person chicken processing facility can be taught in 20 minutes. How would you like to feel if your job, if your vocation could be learned in 20 minutes? 
How human would you feel? It's not unlike Henry Ford, who took foreigners through the Ford plants early on, and, um, and, and he would just exult over the, you know, he's the godfather of the assembly line, and, um, and they'd ask him, you know, is, is there anything, is there any downside to this? You know what he always told his visitors? The only downside to this whole system is that I've got to hire a whole man when all I need are his hands. I'd like to work for that guy, you know. And yet that is a great philanthropic, I almost start there. Routinization, same thing every day, every day, every day. And finally, mechanization. Let's see how few people we can involve with it, and let's try to get the, the people out of it, okay? I, one of the, I think one of the most interesting things that Wendell Berry ever did was he sent a, he sent a request to the University of, of Wisconsin and one of the big three, I don't know whether it was Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club, or Audubon Society, one of the big three environmental groups, said, could you please send me a picture of your, of your perfect uh, uh, world, of, of your perfect, what, what, what do you imagine when you think about uh, the perfect kind of place you'd like to, w w that we'd like, we, we ought to have for ourselves? Could you send me a picture of that? University of Wisconsin uh, Ag Department sent back a, 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 a configuration of, a, of an astrodome farm, you know, with robotics, hydroponics, and, and, and all this. And uh, of course, you know, there, there's not a single person in, in, the, in the farm. It's, it's an astrodome covered robotic, you know, thing. The environmental group sent a picture of a, you know, of an eagle flying over a Rocky Mountain and Wendell Berry made the astute observation, neither one of them has a human in it. So at their core, both of them hate humans. That's Wendell Berry. I want to grow up and be like him someday. But specialization, simplification, routinization, mechanization. Think about nature. Think about nature. Is nature specialized? No, it's diversified. Is it simplified? No, it's highly complex. Is it routinized? No, it's highly dynamic. Anybody that's farmed knows it, it changes. Is it mechanized? No, it's fundamentally biological, not mechanized. So we have this going on. So by 1900, we move forward a few more years. By 1900, we have the industrial economy in full flow. We've got urbanization. Uh, you know, cities, urban centers are, are growing like crazy. And we're facing starvation again. An acute dislocation of rural nutrients to the urban centers. The cities are covered in poop. In fact, if you go back and you look at old editorials, in newspapers from 1900 to 1910, you will find them routinely lamenting the implosion of the American city under an avalanche of poop. It was everywhere. It was in the street sides. It was in the streets. In fact, um, uh, during Charles Dickens' England time, of course, England industrialized faster than America. Uh, so it was, you know, it was half a century ahead of us in, in, in industrialization as far as a, a cultural dynamic. And, um, and one of the, the common ways that little urban boys would earn income was um, to stand with brooms at street corners and um, businessmen would, or, or women with parasols or whatever, would give them a, a little bit of money and these kids would go ahead of them across the street and sweep all the poop off the street so they didn't get it all caked over their shoes. But poop was taken into the bake shop, the meat shop, the bridal shop. Poop was everywhere. Farms, meanwhile, were losing their labor to city factories. Why stay at home, Dad, when I can go to town and work in the steel mill? Work in the uh, the the, the um, manufacturing plant, the uh, the looms, the mill milling, and so by 1900, 1910, there was a, a worldwide concern among thinkers: we're all going to starve to death. And of course, the poop situation was solved by the automobile. 
And the fertility problem was still was ongoing. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, there's a very famous Britisher named Sir Albert Howard. During this time, 1915 to 1945, who is working away in one of the British colonies called India. And um, he's working away in India, and he's learning from the native population there, the Indians, how they kept fertility going. But he's a, he's a really observant scientist, and he's taking this, and he leverages this up, ratchets it up. And in 1943, releases to the world a blockbuster similar to what um, Justice von Liebig released in 1837, a little more than a century apart. The title of his release, some of you may know, was An Agricultural Testament. It is still considered the Bible of the regenerative agriculture movement, like Wendell Berry is considered the father of the, of the modern sustainable ag movement. For the first time, a scientist developed the scientific aerobic compost process called the indoor method, that's what he called it. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, water, and microbes. The, the, the very specific formula of the ratio of these things, the carbon-nitrogen ratio, all that sort of things. Uh, the, the Indians, in, in, their, in their heritage back, they didn't, they didn't know about carbon, they didn't call it nitrogen, they didn't, so, so he was able to, to create a formula and, 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 the, and the, the, the formulas for how much of this you have to have. 1943, this comes to the world. But the world's really busy in 1943 with WWII, yeah, World War II. And interestingly, bombs, explosives are made out of N, P, and K. And so you have World War I and World War II right in this critical time of, of fertility loss. And, and now we've gone all the way to Oregon and Washington and California. And so there's no new land. There's no farmers. You, you, there's no more west to go. Australia is now fully settled. New Zealand is now fully settled. Here we are worldwide in a more acute problem than we were in 1837 where we still had half of our continent to settle or exploit. By the 1940s, it was done. There was no place to go. And what are we going to do? And so here we are in 1947. And you have two options. One is this this. this scientific aerobic composting method. Or you can get this little bag of 10, 10, 10 and spread it on your field. Now remember, you've already lost a couple of your sons to the city, maybe a couple of them to the war, and you're there as a farmer in 1947. One, this is Shoveling, compost. We don't have front end loaders on tractors yet. You're presented shoveling. Shoveling. <laughs> shoveling. What have you been doing all your life? Shoveling. I'm tired of shoveling. Give me the bag, which is very cheap because the war effort has paid for the mining development, laboratory development, distribution development, marketing development of this little 10, 10, 10 bag. Interstitial here in the discussion. Be gentle on grandpa. You and I in the same position, we may have done the same thing. It's so easy, isn't it, to lose context. So be gentle on Grandpa, okay? Really, I'm serious. Be gentle on Grandpa. Now, 
If you study the diffusion of innovation, read business books about innovation and how it diffuses. This is a little bit of interlude here. So we, we got kind of two stories here. We got the bag of tin, tin, tin. We've got shovel, shovel, shovel. Okay. All right. It's an interlude. Let's look at innovation. There's a lag time to metabolize the point of innovation. There's always a lag time. Um, you know, urbanization, at, at this time, the big point of innovation was urbanization. Factories, the, 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 the really bringing a lot of people together. And so, remember, the first supermarket was not until 1946. That's the first official supermarket, 1946. So here we are, 1900 to 1940, all right? We've got massive urbanization factories. We've, we, we've fought two world wars. Uh, and during this time, I mean, um, sewage in 1900, you know, 1910, the sewage is still running in the streets. People don't have indoor plumbing. Electricity is still in its infancy. I mean, Vanderbilt House was the first electronic house in the U.S., and it was only finished, you know, by a multi-billionaire in, you know, 1899. So, so electricity was, was in its end. There was no refrigeration. None of this stuff was going on. And so the cities were the, the cultural innovation of the day pre all of the infrastructure knowledge and, and, and stuff around the point of innovation that allowed the city to be hygienic, sanitary, and functional. Are you with me? Just to help us to understand this, this example of diffusion for today, let's look at e-commerce, okay? We're all familiar with e-commerce. It's a big deal, you know. I grew up where there, there was no e-commerce. You know, one of our apprentices the other day yells down from the living room, what are these great big CDs? <laughs> Called LP, phonograph records. Yeah, never seen one. So we've been struggling as a culture for the last 15 years with e-commerce and local sales tax now. I'm not interested in big taxes. I'm, I'm pretty conservative. Um, but I do appreciate that if you have a tax collection system based on a physical cash register to collect sales tax, if that's what you're depending on for schools and roads and you know, trash pickup and other things, amenities that city people want, what happens when suddenly innovation runs away from that and there is no cash register? It's a big problem. Now we're seeing software right? And we're seeing uh, codes and state uh, regulations to collect it, and it's all being worked out. But it's taken about 15 years for that point of e-commerce innovation for, for, the, for the ragged edge to kind of catch up with it, all the other stuff. Another one, the, the, the next one looming on our horizon, I think, another big one, is going to be metadata mining and censorship from big social media platforms. I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a cultural backlash, isn't there, against Facebook. It's like, nobody wants to be on it, but nobody wants to get off of it. <laughs> and so we're having hearings, you know, we're having Mark Zuckerberg hauled up before, you know, congressional hearings for prejudice and exclusion, and are you really a, a public utility? Are you really just a private thing that can do whatever you want to? and social media discourse, and where's the new conversation happening, and, and, all right, it's not solved yet. It'll be worked out over time. So, or, do you see what I'm getting here? It is the ragged edge of innovation? So, if the answer to fertility was a biological carbon economy, what we needed to make that work was Plastic pipe for water, drip irrigation, watering compost piles. We needed chippers to, to chip, you know, dead trees for biomass. We needed front-end loaders for materials handling so everybody didn't have to shovel all the time. We needed efficient PTO uh, manure spreaders for, for hauling the biomass out to the field. We needed chainsaws for, for, for tree work and, and, and biomass uh, remediation work. All of this stuff from plastic pipe to chippers to front end loaders to if, 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 you know, water systems, water pipe, polyethylene pipe, chainsaws, uh, PTO shafts. I mean, those didn't even come until the 1950s. 
you know, it, it, it sobers me to realize, because I'm the chainsaw guy. I mean, I, it's, my third arm is a chainsaw. And, and to think that the chainsaw as we know it today has only come in my lifetime, and I'm not that old. That's, that's pretty profound. So here's the thing. By the late mid-1950s, these, these elements that were required to make Sir Albert Howard's gift to the world of the uh, uh, scientific aerobic composting method, the whole decomposition idea, that, and, and, and Bill Mollison was not on the scene. You know, uh, Dave Holmgren was not on the scene. P.A. Yeomans was just formulating the key line uh, system with sway. I mean, think of all of the amazing innovations that have happened since the 19, 1950. Um, Rodale Dale started publishing Organic Gardening and Farming magazine in 1949. Okay, the word organic, he invented it in backlash to what he saw, this, this, this chemical thing coming on in, in 1949. And so by the late mid-1950s, all of the, this, this, uh, um, this structure that was necessary to make, to make a carbon, a biomass-centric uh, system work was just coming on, it was just developing. By 1960, it was developed a lot farther. By 1970, it was refined almost to perfection. So it took roughly 20 years to metabolize Sir Albert Howard. But the war effort leveraged the mechanical side with mining, manufacturing, distribution, and marketing. So the mechanical side, the chemical side, had this massive head start, this infusion of, 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 of military and, and you know, Pentagon budgeting to give it a head start so that in 1947, if, if we say 1947 is kind of a 46, it is kind of a restart, somebody you know, shot the gun, it's as, if, it's as if the chemical approach had a, had a, a two lap head start on a four lap race. And it took 20 years for our side, we weren't sitting still, okay, for our side to begin developing things, all right? They had a big head start. So the bottom line is this. If we had had a Manhattan Project for compost, not only would we have fed the world, we would have done it without infertile frogs, three-legged salamanders, and a dead zone the side of, of Rhode Island and the Gulf of Mexico. That's the truth. Now, today, there's no contest. We got four-wheel drive front-end loader tractors that are so miserly on fuel, you can run them all day on two gallons of fuel. We've got cool, you know, efficient chippers. We've got compost thermometers. We've got emulsified biological concentrate. We've got electromagnified foliar spray with calypso music to open the stomata and receive the electromagnetically charged. We've got worm pee. We got, you can even have worm pee, worm tea. I mean, you do all these things. We have now completely run away in the biological sphere. We have run away from that Neanderthal barbaric chemical structure, but it still inhabits our land-grant universities and our you know, multinational corporations and the mindset of the culture so much that even people who want to espouse what we believe have trouble doing it because oh, I'm not sure half of us would be here if we hadn't had the chemical green revolution which is, of course, a lie. So, that was number one. <laughs> but, 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 is that helpful? Yeah. Good, all right. Number two, number two, can we feed the world? Number two, there are millions of acres of unused land. Millions of acres. I won't even put the Bureau of Land Management in, all right? I'll just leave them out for now. Although I'd be happy if they didn't exist. Whew, that's a revolutionary, isn't it? <laughs> there are 35 million acres of lawn and 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. Now, now, now I'm not opposed to horses, okay? Don't anybody read into this, okay? You got to realize the first time I gave this, uh, one of the times I gave this talk was in Kentucky. <laughs> uh, 
But that's 35 million acres of lawn, 36 million acres for horses. That's 71 million acres, gentle people. That's enough to feed the whole U.S. without a single farm. Especially if we did it with good management. Now, think of what we've done with produce production, you know, compared to 100 years ago. I mean, we've got spin farming. We've got the lean farm with Ben Hartman. We've got Elliot Coleman. I mean, what a, what a guru he is. Jean Martin Fortier. We've got Singing Frogs Farm. Uh, we, you know, I hate to even start down these lists, but, but these, are, these are, are internationally famous gurus that are, that are using modern technology, understanding of microscopic biology, aggregation of soil glomulin. I mean, the word glomulin, you know, wasn't even invented until like 20 years ago. It's a brand new word. Isn't that amazing? Only 10% of all the soil microorganisms, only 10% have even been named. So 90% of all those critters, those, those, those 5 billion critters, you know, living in a double handful of healthy soil, 90% of them, we don't even know what to call them. You know, the four-legged critter from wherever, you know, from the actinomycetes. Um, we don't know what to call them. I mean, we are, but, but we're learning, and we're learning, we're learning fast. The ability for, um, for pasture-based livestock. I mean, think about it. the electric fence. The electric fence is basically a post-1950 invention. And I remember in the early 60s when I was a kid, you know, um, um, a lot of us farmers, when we started with these electric fencers, you know, they, they were scavenged. The Energizer was a scavenged um, uh, distributor cap out of a car engine that fired the spark plugs. And, uh, and, and we walked around, I remember as a kid walking around with a piece of emery cloth in my pocket. So every time we went by the Energizer, which was, which was physically, physically, you know, boing, 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 right? We, um, I, I'd open the box, clean out the cobwebs, and uh, shine up the little points, the points and condenser in a cart. Now carts don't even have points and condensers. Um, but that's what we'd shine up, because they'd get, you know, tarnished and get, uh, you know, wet in there. And, um, and I, I can remember when in the late 1960s, from Sears and Roebuck, which is now bankrupt, we got our very first solid state energizer. And it's, it's a big blue box and it sits in the shop and it says, no moving parts. That was a, that was a, a, a breakthrough. It was, it was an amazing, uh, innovative breakthrough. Now we actually had something that was dependable. And so we could actually start to control things better. And so now we could do mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization. And, <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, uh, 30 years later came along uh, electrified netting with polyethylene. I mean, you know, think about how many of us are using electrified netting with our poultry and turkeys. Well, I guess turkeys are poultry, but anyway, poultry um, and, and sheep and, and pigs and farrowing and all this stuff, uh, this electrified netting. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't use that 50 years ago when the spark length was point four seconds because it was a physical boing, boing, boing. And so the resistance built up in the lines and would have melted polyethylene. Today, with, uh, with, with, with uh, microchip energizers, we've now dropped that spark length to 0.004 seconds, four thousandths of a second, so we can, we can up the voltage to 10,000, but it's so short there's no resistance and we can run it through a polyethylene netting and keep out coyotes and wolves and bears from our poultry with something that's so light, 150 feet of it only weighs 10 pounds and one person can take it up and put it down in 10 minutes. Is that not cool? See? So on our farm, our county average, our, our county average of cow days per acre in our county is 80. A cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. Take all the food you eat today, put it on a plate. That would be one person day of food, okay? So what one cow will eat in a day is one cow day of food. Our county average is 80. So an acre will support 80 cows for one day a year or one cow for 80 days a year. And on our farm, we average 
You ready for the number? More than 400 cow days per acre. And we haven't planted a seed or bought a bag of chemical fertilizer in 60 years. That's not bragging. That's giving homage and honor and respect to an infinite creator's design of nature's template that if we would simply be humble enough to follow it, the abundance that follows would knock your socks off. We live in a time of, 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 of paranoia and scarcity as if nature is this, is this reluctant partner that we've got to get in a half Nelson and I'm going to make you grow this and you know. Instead of actually being a benevolent lover who just responds to a caress. Now we have Alan Savory, holistic management, mixed cropping, pasture cropping, Colin Sice, Gabe Brown. We've got, we've got uh, uh, um, seed cocktails. We've got Ray Achatula, you know, soil understanding. I mean, it's up the wazoo. What we now understand that, that we can, that we can um, do with this land that we have. Um, so lots of unused land that we can use for other things. And we now know that, that farming, farming can actually increase soil. And that's our mandate now, is increasing soil. Number three, number three, we have symbiotic integrated systems. Symbiotic integrated systems. And of course, you know, singing frogs, um, uh, as well as, as, as quail uh, farm there. We, 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 we saw it beautifully illustrated this morning. But the best linear factory monospeciated production doesn't even pro approach the production of even the most rudimentary, novice, diversified, complex, integrated backyard garden. The current system is highly segregated. Factory farming uh, takes, takes animal blessing that's supposed to be out blessing the land uh, with their moving fertility around and, and, and pruning and restarting the biomass and all that and turns it into a curse of toxicity of overload in a certain spot. Anything that nature views as an asset that we turn into a liability is inherently wrong. Farms should be aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic so they can be embedded in community. We call this nook and cranny farming or urban farming and there's now technology for these modalities. Um, there's technology for uh, mobile control, shelter, water, feed. Uh, if this can all now uh, with, with, uh, with piping and, and I mean on our farm we've got eight miles of gravity fed water. We built permaculture ponds uh, up in not in streams or springs but just to catch surface runoff because even in here even though you only get four inches of rain a year I'll guarantee you there are times in the year where water is everywhere and if all that surface runoff can be impounded for later use you can in essentially double, triple, and quadruple the amount of hydration on the landscape. That's what the beavers were doing, okay? Which the legislature now denies. And most radical environmentalists also don't want. Cut from the same cloth. So I think our mantra needs to be, we don't have to be the beavers, I mean, we don't have the beavers, but we need to be the beavers if we want the same level of production that we had when the beavers were here. That needs to be our, one of our new messages, I think. And so the technologies with electric fencing and water pipe and all this stuff, uh, you know, on our farm we have eight miles of water pipe that, 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 that gravity feeds. So we have uh, 70 PSI water, eight miles across the farm, no pumps, no electricity, just gravity. Again, that's not bragging. That's simply taking a resource and caressing it. If all of the effort over the last 200 years to plow and plant corn to feed herbivores who aren't supposed to eat it anyway had been used to develop high permaculture style ponds in the mountains surrounding our valley, today we would be drought proof and flood proof and would have reinstituted Eden. But instead we plowed it all up for the Holy Grail to export grain and ship three to five feet of topsoil down to the Chesapeake Bay, destroyed the crabs, turned it into turbidity, and us into rocks. 
See, the tragedy of the human experience is not that we're lazy. We're all busy. Who doesn't have a full calendar? We've got places to go, people to see, things to do. The tragedy of the human experience is that we're so successful at hitting the bullseye of the wrong target. And so I'm a big believer in kitchen chickens. You know, we, right now, we, we, 75% of everything we put in landfills in this country is compostable. That's a moral disgrace. We should all be kneeling in sackcloth and ashes, repenting for our sins of this, of this, this assault against, this is biomass, solar energy, photosynthetically through chlorophyll put into biomass to feed the soil biota and we dump it in a landfill but guess what we're so clever we come along now with new crazy you know greeny greeny weeny ideas that we can now plunge a pipe in here collect the methane to run all the big equipment at the landfill and get an environmental award <laughs> when what we need to be doing is not sending any scrap food to the landfill and Pat Foreman, who wrote City Chicks, identifies that if, if one out of every three households in America, and yes, I mean condominiums, I mean apartments, I mean throw out the gerbil, the cat, the dog, the boa constrictor, put in two chickens, they don't take any more room than a flat screen TV, you can even stick it up against the wall, feed them your kitchen scraps, and they'll turn your garbage into eggs. And we wouldn't even have an egg industry. And we'd be able to keep the stuff out of our landfills. And you know what? When I think of kitchen chickens, I think, wow, what a role model for teens. I mean, think about the chicken. The chicken, she gets up real early in the morning, happy. Ever seen, ever seen a mopey chicken in the morning? You ever go out, those of you who have chickens, you go out and feed them in the morning? You ever seen one moping around? No, nah, man, they greet the morning there early. They can't wait to come up off that roost, come up off that bed and, and go find a worm and get a drink. And they're, they're zest for life, right? Who? it's morning, let's go, you know. And then they spend all day eating garbage, turning it into treasure. And then at night, as soon as the sun starts to go down, do they go say, hey, we want to put a night on the town? No, indeed. They go head for the roost. Man, I'm going to bed. I mean, what a perfect role model for teenagers. <laughs> That's the ultimate integrated system. How about solariums? Solariums for leafy greens off season. You know, if every single structure that we built had a southern solarium on the side of it, not only would we be able to do a lot of passive solar heat in our houses, low tech, gentle tech, but we'd also be able to eliminate the extractive and, and, and uh, uh, pathogen laden leafy green trucking and marketing from industrial uh, production and being trucked places. I think there's three good uses for petroleum. One is plastic for season extension. The second one is for water pipe. And the third one is to build ponds. Those are three good uses of petroleum. Number four. Number four, spoilage. Spoilage. Nearly 50% of all human edible food is now thrown away. That's never been like that in the history of humanity. I mean, we think we're so efficient. We are atrociously inefficient. And 75% of everything that goes in landfills is compostable. Why is all this food thrown away? Well, it might be the wrong fit. You know, I was recently uh, in a conference with a guy from Zimbabwe, and he'd just been to a, a green bean cannery in Zimbabwe for the EU. He said they were running four tons a day through this green bean cannery, and two tons were going for market, and two tons were going to the landfill. I said, well... What was wrong with the two tons going to the landfill? He said, oh, well, they're, they're too long, they're too short, they're, too, they're bent, they're not bent enough, they're, you know, whatever. I mean, we've got, this, we've got this, this fixation on cosmetic produce that's just uh, um, crazy. Uh, maybe there's a little blemish on it. Uh, maybe the sell-by date, you know, goes out. Uh, transport damage. 
Uh, I mean, when the average food item travels 2,000 or 1,500 miles from the farm to the plate, uh, there's a lot of damage in transport and, and, and mechanical, you know, mechanical handling. Um, I mean, just with a small farm and, and hand labor, um, we're able to we're able to salvage all the the, the broken, blemished, glitched uh, uh, produce that's out there. Uh, recalls, recalls from labeling issues, regulatory glitches, foodborne pathogens, all sorts of things. You know, in the early 2000s, the Government Accounting Office did a report on foodborne uh, pathogenicity. And um, here were their four reasons. This is one report that the government actually got it right. They said there are four reasons why we have a foodborne pathogen problem in the U.S., which is, you know, a reason for a lot of the recalls, which is another reason why a lot of the food doesn't get eaten. The first problem, they said, this is the Government Accounting Office, said is centralized production. Centralized production. Number two, centralized processing. Number three, long distance transportation. Number four, subtherapeutic antibiotic use making superbugs and MRSA and C. diff and all that sort of thing. Now, I don't know about you, but I would like to think that if I were an elected official and I received a report that scientifically identified the four major causes of foodborne pathogenicity and was able to clearly identify them, this is hard. But, but I think, I think that I would say, well, if that's the problem, perhaps the opposite would be the solution. I, I, mean, I mean, is that reasonable? So let's, let's look at them again in that light. Look at them again. All right. Centralized production. Well, what's the opposite of centralized production? Uh, yeah, it sounds a lot like, like, you know, lots of small family farms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how about number two? Centralized processing. Sounds like cottage industry, right? Home canneries, little community, you know, food hubs and things like that. How about number three? This, this is a hard one. This is a really hard one. Long distance transportation. Oh, I gotta think, I gotta think. Long distance, what would be the opposite? Can anybody, am I, I'm struggling here. <laughs> Local, okay, like, like short chains of custody close markets. And number four, subtherapeutic antibiotic use. How about we raise our animals so that there is a habitat of immunological function? Hmm. Imagine that. You know, if we sat down here and had a conspiratorial committee, let's design a farm system, a food system that actually encourages pathogenicity and toxicity. And we're going to form a three-person committee here decide what kind of farming would be terrible uh, for, you know, for sickness. It would be sickness-inducing and disease-inducing. Um, and we said, well, go, go, go make this report, okay? And so in a month, we'd come back with the report, and what would we say? Well, we would say, um, <clears throat> with this uh, diabolical, conspiratorial theme, we would say, all right, if we want sick animals, let's see. The first thing we want to do is make sure that we only raise one kind of animal on a farm. I mean, we don't want the, we don't want the pathogens to be confused. Uh, we, we, need, you know, we, we need hosts, the same hosts, all the time, 24, 7, 365. Okay, and um, let's see, what else? Uh, we, we'll, we'll crowd them up real close, and we don't want the pathogens to have to work hard between hosts. We want them to be able to jump from back to jowl to tail to ear, you know, real easily in, in, the, you know, in, in the millimeter range. So we're going we're gonna to crowd them in real closely. Uh, let's see, number three. Uh, let's see, let's... Um, let's Let's uh, 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 put them in a building so they, they breathe in a fecal particulate. And this fecal particulate could be like sandpaper, like, like poop sandpaper that goes in their mucous membranes and creates bleeding lesions in their respiratory tracts and sends manure into their bloodstream directly. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be a good system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then let's make sure they don't get fresh air, sunshine, or exercise. I mean, sunshine is a kind of big sanitizer, so let's make sure they don't get any of that. All right, you see where I'm going with this. What have I just described? Modern factory farming. That's right. 
So uh, it, it just, it's just amazing. And, and this was done, you know, this was done almost 20 years ago, this official government report. Um, wow. So just remember, whenever someone says we're going to run out short of food, that's right out of the Monsanto playbook. Because Monsanto loves us to be fearful. Because they know we want our grandchildren to eat. We don't want them to starve. So if we really believe that there's not going to be enough food for our grandchildren, we will swallow anything for security. And that's right out of the Monsanto playbook. So whenever somebody tells you uh, we're short of food, there's not enough food, we're too many people, and any of these kinds of things, just smile and say, Monsanto would be so proud of you. <laughs> really, I'm, 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 I'd do it, okay? And, uh, and it's, a, it's a nice, nice way to start a conversation. <laughs> Finally, number five, and we're gonna be done. Number five, <clears throat> can we supply the world with food? Yes, especially if we unleash the latent entrepreneurial food farm community by deregulating direct producer-consumer food commerce. Here's the deal, folks. All food regulations are scale prejudicial. If I want to make pepperoni and I need and the government says, I need a $2,000 thermometer to do monitoring. If all I want to do is a five-gallon bucket full, that $2,000 thermometer just stopped me. But if I'm going to do a tractor-trailer load, $2,000 thermometer is a spit in the ocean. It's nothing. Now, people say, well, Good grief. Give me an example of a non-scale non prejudicial regulation. Okay, I'll give you one. Speed limits. It doesn't take any more strength, paperwork, or, or energy to push the brake on an 18-wheeler than it does on a Prius. Okay? Speed limits are a great example of, of regulations that are non-scalable. But almost all of these food regulations are prejudicial to small scale. And the problem is that prototypes, which by definition are where the edge of innovation exists, prototypes require embryonic launches. And when the experimental embryo, when the baby because of HACCP plans, paperwork, licenses, infrastructure, stainless steel, equipment, when all of that is so onerous that the baby has to be birthed big, it can't be birthed. It denies the farmers the chance to sell and the consumers the chance to opt out. Um, which is one reason why I asked the senator this morning uh, about the safety of Coca-Cola. I think it's pretty amazing that we have come with our plethora of regulations to the fact where you can feed your kid, find three glasses, uh, three cans of Coca-Cola a day, but one teaspoon of raw milk is unsafe. You know, we live in an unprecedented age of tolerance. We're all told to be tolerant. Well, I got a question for everybody that wants to be tolerant. How about tolerating my freedom to purchase the food of my choice from the source of my choice? Yay. How about that? But just like you heard this morning, you will hear all sorts of, oh, we've got to protect the safety. We've got to, we've got to, we've got to be balanced here. Folks, this year, this year, we're at the beginning of 2019. This year, 50 children will drown in backyard swimming pools in the U.S. 
It happens every single year. Fences, no fences, size, doesn't matter. 50 kids drown every year in American backyard swimming pools. <laughs> Electric fence. Electrify the water. <laughs> <Whoop -hoo! laughs> Gentle folks, remember, there haven't been 50 people die. There hasn't been one death from raw milk documented. So clearly, we are very subjective about what we consider to be safe. That's the problem with defining safety. You know, I think the way 90% of the population feeds their kids is unsafe and child abuse. We live in, a, you know, we live in this age where we're supposed to be tolerant and yet, and, 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 and we love to tolerate the Arab Spring. We love to tolerate the, the, you know, the, the, the Kurds, you know, the rebels. We love rebels that are trying to cast off the chains of tyranny all over the world. But if anybody here wants to cast off the chains of tyranny, you're suddenly a criminal. And we can't tolerate you. You go, into the, you go into the supermarket, it appears to be abundant. But there's a lot of stuff not in the supermarket. Where's the raw milk? Where's the homemade charcuterie? Where's Aunt Matilda's pot pie? There's a lot of food culture, of indigenous food culture. In fact, 90% of the stuff that our grandmothers ate at 1900 is not in the supermarket anymore. It would be unrecognizable. I'm with, I'm with Michael Pollan, you know, I think pretty much we, we should, 1900 is kind of the litmus test, you know. Any, it, we shouldn't eat anything that wasn't available before 1900. And we could all be thankful that hot dogs were introduced at the 1890 World's Fair. You know, it just kind of... <laughs> This whole food security thing, I mean, think about, if, if, we, if we actually created um, what I like to call a food emancipation proclamation and freed up the shackles of community, local, entrepreneurial food artisans from these asinine regulations, we would see small-scale community-based food systems explode. Everywhere I go in the world, there are people just chafing to access their community with stews and, and, and you know, quiche and, 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 you know, processed food. See, you, you would like to think, you would like, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, people like me in this movement, we were, we were, we couldn't wait until 2015 when everybody's going to get it and this latent, this, this, this tiny, tiny little uh, food system, you know, that grew out of the environmental movement of the 1970s, you know, and as a culture we had the, you know, we had the, uh, you know, the love affair with TV dinners and Velveeta cheese in the 1950s, you know, probably the, you know, the, the epitome of, of that anti-natural was, um, Infamil and Similac for kids and the thought that, you know, breastfeeding children was barbaric and Neanderthal. We don't want to do that. And so we raised a, a generation that way. Uh, who would have guessed in 1960 you know, that by 1975, La Leche League would be here. We'd have breastfeeding classes. We'd have Lamas. We'd have, you know, um, um, uh, dads to be going to Lamas classes and, and breathing and, <gasps> you know, and all this stuff, you know, and, and, and be there to watch it and help it. And I mean, that was, that was amazing. I, I still think that probably one of the, one of the greatest um, resource abuses of our culture has been those 30 years of not using all the breasts. It's just awful. <laughs> what a waste of resource. Anyway, anyway, I, I get sidetracked. Um, here's the point. The, the, the beaded, bearded, braless revolution of the, of the hippie movement finally migrated into this local artisanal awareness movement. And, and we, we watched this and we said, you know what, in a few years, 
Everybody's going to be in their kitchen. They're going to know their farmer. They're going to want carrots with dirt on them. And they're going to want to, and, and they're going to be wiping those carrots off and, and having all those soil microbiota coming in and communicating with, hello, cousin, the microbiome inside. And, you know, it's all going to be really cool. And, 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 and you know, and, and the domestic culinary arts are going to be sexy again. And it's going to be the neatest thing in the world. What we got was industrial organics, hydroponic organics. We got uh, dinner in a box, Martha Stewart, and um, um, everything prepared. I mean, at our farm, what we, what we say now is what our, what our customers really want is, in, is uh, polyface hot pockets. <laughs> so here we are. And, 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 and so, so, to, so while I would like to think that people would buy unprocessed stuff for their food, they're not. The only real fast growth sector in the, in the food uh, sector today in the country is integrity convenience. Snack sticks, protein shakes. It's all about convenience, okay? And that's not going to change anytime real soon. Which throws the farmer into the conundrum of now there's a very limited market for unprocessed stuff. It's almost like we have two paths. We can either, we can either teach our constituents, our patrons, how to cook, or we can cook for them and sell it to them. Neither one of those is a path that's embraced by most farmers. We just want to go out and grow stuff. Because they make us want to have to deal with people, and most farmers don't like people. That's why we're farmers. <laughs> I'll talk about that a lot more in my workshop. All right, so anyway. So, so what we've got is, is we've got the, the need for accessing the consumer with, with uh, heat and eat solutions, um, easy fixes, that sort of thing. Um, you know, food deserts is a big deal. What about food deserts? Well, the solution is not more food banks. The solution is urban farming. You know, um, just imagine this. You know, let's take a bad case. Let's take, you know, a, 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 a single mom of four kids. Maybe, okay, we'll, we'll even go with she's a minority, all right? She got this vacant lot next door. She says, hey, you know, we could grow a garden in there and have some chickens and rabbits and make, uh, make pot pies for the, you know, for the community. So they go out and diligently start, you know, turning the lot into this beautiful, productive place and producing some eggs and she's going to make some quiche and going to make some, some uh, chicken pot pie there and that sort of thing. And so she goes in and she starts making this in her, in her uh, apartment and, um, and she's going to sell it there to people in the, in the food desert. And what's going to happen before she can even get one out the door? She's going to have 10 knocks on her door. Well, you can't do a business in a residential thing. We can't integrate residences and commercial space. I mean, that would be like the cobbler living over his shop. No, we could never do that. <laughs> I mean, we've got to segregate our economy. We, we're, we're so segregated now. You know, we've got, if, you want, if, you, if you can afford a 2,000 square foot house, you can build it over here. And, and if it's only 1,500, if that's all you can afford, you can build that over here. I mean, we wouldn't want the 2,000 square footers and the 1,500 square footers to have to do anything together. Uh, 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 that, that would not work. Yeah. You know. So we, we, we practice this incredible economic segregation. Um, you know, uh, uh, do you have a HACCP plan? Uh, oh, this building is a residence. It's not zoned for commercial. We'd have to double the size of the beams in the roof. Doesn't matter that the building is, you know, 50 years old and never caved in. Uh, we just can't make anything in it. Uh, you know, do you have fire extinguishers? Do you have handicapped parking? Do you have uh, handicapped access? Or do you satisfy this? You know, do you, um, I mean, just imagine if in order to put something on eBay, you had to go to eBay school, get a license, and, and, and have OSHA inspect your office to make sure you don't have a plywood table that you, when you jump up with your first uh, hot, hot bid, you know, you get a splinter in your hiney from jumping up on your table. And, and uh, an electrical, uh, electrical inspection to make sure your cobweb of wires underneath doesn't blow up when you get all this influx of, of people wanting your product. And <laughs> Would we have eBay? No! See? And that's why, that's why our, our, our food system is, um, is, is, is struggling. 
uh, because we have this limited access. So, uh, so what we're getting to, what we're getting to now is, is a, a need for creativity. This is where Farm and Consumer Legal Defense Fund uh, comes in. I hope everybody goes and joins them today. Uh, or, well, not, you know, anyway, as soon as you can. Farm and Consumer Legal Defense Fund are probably doing more for this than, than, than anybody uh, to preserve that freedom of market access. Because what good does it do to produce it if you can't get it to a marketable state? And so um, a handful of us are actually thinking about doing a conference next year, maybe in Cincinnati. I'm calling it the Rogue Food Conference. The Rogue Food Conference is all going to be about how to circumvent instead of comply. Because what happens is when tyranny gets so high, it's actually more cost effective and more emotionally effective to circumvent than comply. And what we're seeing is pockets springing up all over the country of PMAs. Those are personal membership associations modeled after country clubs, but for food, for food exchanges. And the most successful ones right now is in Louisville, Kentucky. And these guys have a big storefront, and I mean, they are, they are, they are bringing in everything completely unlicensed, under, I mean, from raw milk to homemade cheese to, to, to soup, uh, everything you can imagine. And the state's having a fit, and nobody can touch them because it's a PMA, it's not a public deal. Uh, there's a lady in North Carolina that started a uh, bona fide 5013C. She's got her license or permit. A, she's a, a, a food church. <laughs> and so what we're seeing is just a dynamic uh, creativity around the country that I hope to really shine a light on. Uh, because we're at the point where circumvention is probably more efficacious than compliance at this point on, on some things. Here's my question. Who could possibly oppose the freedom of choice among voluntary consenting adults? I'm choosing my language very carefully here. Who could possibly oppose freedom of choice among voluntary consenting adults to self-determine the fuel for their three trillion member microbiome? Who could possibly be opposed to that? So there's, there would be an, if, if we allowed that, there would be an explosion of food from suburbia and rooftop gardens that would completely invert the power, position, and prestige of the current agro-industrial food complex. And it would be brought to its knees and brought to its day of, of recharging by liberty, not by regulation. You can't have thriving small business and growing government. We've tried regulations and it's gotten us hydroponic organics, Walmart industrial organics. How about trying liberty for a change? So, with these five points, I hope that you have some new ammunition, some new thoughts to communicate with a smile and with confidence to those who would dare to suggest that growing with compost instead of 10-10-10 and growing with ladybugs instead of, I don't even know what the insecticide names are, Zappo. That's probably not one, but it, it sounds like a good name for an insecticide. <laughs> I don't even live in that world, okay? I'd love to be ignorant about that world because my world is a beautiful, pleasing, productive world. And I think that we're seeing at this conference a great demonstration of the fact not only can we feed the world, we're the only ones who can with respect and honor and humility. Let's get at it. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. May the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your culinary experiments be delectably palatable. <laughs> May the rain fall gently on your fields, the wind be always at your back, your children rise and call you blessed, and may we all make our nest 
a better place than we inherited. God bless you. Thank you.